Well, I think we all know the drill at this point, that this is just for fun and nothing serious. I'm reading The Wounded Sky by Diane Duane. Last time, I left off right at the beginning of Chapter 4, and we're going to get into it. I've swapped up my mic just for fun. This is not my better one, but uh, it's just another one I've got, and I feel like I should use it. So here we are at Chapter 4, A Departure, Minus 3 at Departure, Chapter 4. At departure, minus three hours, the Enterprise, from the outside, looked no different than she had on entering Starbase 18. She hung placidly at the heart of the pulsing tactile tractor beam, silver shining and calm. Inside, though, in-ship communications was alive with voices chattering like thoughts in a mind. Look, I don't care what you do to that modulator. Just get it up. If Mr. Mahase finds out that it's... Nervous? Me? Don't be silly. I'm dying. We're secure. What's keeping the rest of you? Terror haste pressure excited, excited, excited. Department head pass. No, pass advanced. Starvation cardiac failure. Query, query. Inexpressible and physiologically unlikely in hominids. Expletive. Damn, exclamation mark. <laughs> Expletive. Exclamation. What do you mean I have to review and sign all these before I can leave? I'm a doctor, damn it, not a bureaucrat. And where's that nurse? You promised me a head nurse, Jim. What am I supposed to do around here with Chapel getting her bloody doctorate and refusing to even pick up a goddamned hypo anymore without giving me a goddamned diagnosis first? You always did bet small. Ten credits. That'll be where... Ten credits that there'll be at least three Klingon destroyers, and we'll handle them in less than four minutes. I... Well, all I know is the captain's on his way down here to have a look at it. So look sharp and clean with that mess up, laddie. I will not have a sloppy deck when Ims will arrive. The exec wants to know when you're going to file completion on the revisions in that program. Mizuhura, the chief of astrocartography, said, letting out a tired sigh. My respects to Mr. Spock. And we're having to rewrite the program practically from line 10 to make the new location coordinates work. You know what it means, just in terms of changes in the broadcast orientation and signal strength for the boys. A weary chuckle. That wasn't the question, Mary. I know, Lieutenant Mary Sagati looked over her shoulder. Danish, she said. How about it? If the sir desires more area covered, the answer came back, the sir must resign himself to the programming, taking a little more time. Right, Mary said. Twenty minutes, she said to Uhura. What? Quiet Danish. Work. Twenty minutes, I, Uhura said. Bridge out. I would kill the respected superior the growly voice said from behind Mary, except that I would only be promoted into her position and still have to finish this job. <laughs> Noted and logged, Mary said, and let out another sigh, and stretched. Mary Sagati was in her mid-twenties, fiercely red-headed, and built like a Valkyrie. She had an open, friendly face with blue eyes that looked sleepy but missed nothing. She finished her stretch and went to stand behind her junior officer, looking over his shoulder as he worked at the main graphics tank. Enzen niwa awath mane, ri denish enu ma ke, said something annoyed under his breath a soft yowl that made Mary think of a tomcat warning another one off his fence. Denish was an Illyrian from Satter Bip. Denish was an Illyrian from Satter, bipedal, and built wiry and slender for his two meters height. His silky ash-blonde mane spilled down over the shorter, plushy platinum fur that covered the rest of him, all but the soft pads on his fingers and toes. Those long fingers patted swiftly on the terminal pad as Denish hunched over it in fierce concentration. In the tank in front of him and Mary, between schematics of the Milky Way galaxy and the Lesser Magellanic Cloud, dots of light in a cubic array subtly shifted their positions, and lines, reaching back from each one of them to specific stars in the Great Spiral Galaxy, shifted as well. Twenty minutes, Dennis growled. Twenty minutes indeed. You people and your minutes and hours. Work should be done when work is done. Mary... 
He broke rhythm long enough to glance up at her. He could have been an intimidating... It could have been an intimidating look. The glare of brown-amber eyes and the long, almost doggy cheetah's face with the upper lip curled just enough to show a fang or two. Mary, however, wasn't buying it. Are all of those optimum transmittal positions? She said. Of course, Dennish said, turning back to his work and patting a few... Of course, Dennish said, turning back to his work and patting a last few of the controls. He sat back then, and the cubic array re- and the cubic array rearranged itself slightly one more time. There is the basic matrix, he said. Now to make an... Ma- There's the basic matrix, he said. Now to make the... Ho- uh, now to make the array holographic, he bent to the keyboard again. Twenty minutes. Mary smiled to herself, seeing the old argument about to start again. If you'd started this last night as you should have instead of waiting till this morning... I started it now, Dennis said without looking up, working with the first point in the array to connect it with all the other receiver stars in the galaxy one at a time. I always start it now. Mary shook her head. Sometimes Dennis didn't seem to make sense, but then Basic didn't have the syntax necessary to convey the Illyrian's peculiar perception of time, and her attempts to learn Sadrao had resulted in a headache from the strange worldview and a sore throat from the Yowly vowels. I know, she said, but sometimes your now is later than it should be. What? Hush up. Work. She stood there silently watching for the next ten minutes or so while Danish worked in furious haste, the dock tail of a Sadrao prince thumping in anxiety and annoyance on the seat of his chair. The computer flashed holographic array complete just seconds before the communication screen whistled. Transmit it quick, Mary said, and Danish slapped the pad and sent the program on its way to the science department and ballistics computers that would need it next. Astrocartography said a familiar, cool voice, Lieutenant Sagatti. It's Mr. Spock. Astrocartography, said a familiar, cool voice, Lieutenant Sagatti. Screen on, she said, turning to it. Yes, Mr. Spock. There was ever so slight a pause as Spock glanced upward at another screen, examining something with his usual calm regard. Acknowledging receipt of the sewing and targeting program for the boys, he said. Bridge out. The screen went dark. Mary sagged against Danish's chair. We just missed getting reprimanded by that much, she said, looking narrowly at Danish to see if he'd gotten the message. He had, and his eyes had gone from slits to amber-ringed nervous circles. We're not reprimanded, though. Danish panted for a breath or two. Mary, believe me, I will not disappoint the captain or this ship. I swear that when I... No, this is a weird tense. Okay. We're not reprimanded, though, Danish panted for a breath or two. Mary, believe me, I will not disappoint the captain or the ship. I swear that when I board her. It's just... He grimaced. Space I can see structuring, but the flow of one's being? Silliness. I can't take it seriously. I know, Mary said, letting out one last sigh and patting the ensign's shoulder. But you can handle it, or they wouldn't have let you aboard ship in the first place. Dennis wrinkled his nose. He might say I do that work well, he muttered. Did he tell you you'd done anything wrong? Then you've just been complimented. Dennis dropped his jaw in a grin. So I am, he said. Are we done? For this shift, yes. Then I'm eating. Are you eating with me? Mary grinned back and went to log out of the office. I am, she said, falling into his phrasing. And I'm eating as many calories as I can get my hands on. Oh, Mary, what about your diet? I am punching you in your big pink nose, Lieutenant Sagatti said with dignity, as soon as I eat enough to get up the strength. Is... This is it, the captain said, looking down with hands on hips and sounding rather disappointed. This is all there is. Katalik chimed briefly, a bell arpeggio of laughter. That's, this is all there ever is, 
she said, jesting. Then, more seriously, Should we have made it bigger? she said to Mr. Scott. Bigger wouldn't have helped, lass, Scotty said. I still wouldn't have understand it. The three of them stood at the heart of the engineering department, on the lowest of the three levels through which the main matter-antimatter mix column pierced. A few meters away from the column, connected to it by a sighting phaser and two power feeder guides, was a transparent metal box about two meters square. Jim Kirk hunkered down to look at it more closely, and saw nothing he hadn't seen from above. Various delicate, glassy-looking inner workings, a trihedrally fractured dilithium crystal in an ordinary five-grip setting, mesoelectronic relay liquids and capsule thurnisters. I would have thought there'd have to be some kind of containment vessel, the captain said, something to keep the infinite mass point from pulling the apparatus in on itself. Not needed. The integrity of the apparatus only needs to be protected before zero time starts. After that, it doesn't matter if it's collapsed in with everything else. In fact, it has to be. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to get home. Scotty shook his head. Lassie, I swore a long time ago that I'd never have anything to... Scotty shook his head. Lassie, I swore a long time ago that I'd never have anything in my engine room that I could not understand. I've never before had anything here that I did not understand by the time I had it installed. But this is the exception. And I don't mind telling you that it's driving me buggy. Well, if you like, I'll do what I can to teach you the physics during the voyage. Catullic's chiming had a tentative sound to it. It may stretch you a little. So it may. But I kind of rest until I understand at least the equations. Scotty shook his head again looking looking utterly perplexed i don't see, i don't see how you derive this beastie from them or even what they do they don't seem to do anything they don't katalek said warming to her subject they merely name the circumstances you wish to invoke and the circumstances happen that's creative physics magic that's what it sounds like scotty said a touch sourly so it does. Why are you so surprised? One of your own people independently codified the third law of ordinance some time back. Clerk, I think his name was. Or Clark. Any science sufficiently advanced will be indistinguishable from magic, which leads directly to Talea's corollary. Catullic, please, save it for later, Jim said as gently as he could. Are we ready to go? Yes, we are. All you need to do is take us a hundred light years out or so and hold an even keel while we make the transit so as not to complicate the vector equations. Done. Jim turned to head for the bridge and then stopped and glanced back at the innocent-looking box sitting there on the engine room floor. The memory of that unsettling visual from the briefing was nagging him. Is there any chance we could get a visual of it working during the jumps for reference purposes? Why not? Scotty said. I'll see to it. Would you like to see it now? Catullic said. Jim was surprised. Wouldn't we have to jump? Catullic chimed. No. It can be activated with no vector or acceleration added, as well as a large one. She went over to the box, reached up with a sharp, shiny foreleg to touch a control pad set in the clear metal, and spoke a precise sequence of notes, quick and imperative. And, in the box... Something happened. A feeling like a shudder went through him. He stood frozen at the heart of the ship, unmoving. Yet he also was the ship. All of it from this terrifying still core of nowness on out. His veins ran with electrons and coolant and artificial gravity. The bright web of tractors and the pale rain of radiation sleeting in from deep space seared his eyes. Unseen but felt, starlight hot with neutrinos burned his skin. That's all there is, Catullic said. Jim twitched, feeling suddenly released, though nothing had held him. I think I missed it, he said, but his words sounded oddly tentative to him. He had seen something. He couldn't remember. He thought he'd seen something anyway. You people did take humans out on the test runs, didn't you? Jim said slowly. Of course. They always missed it too, Captain. 
Kirk nodded. Well? Scotty, see to those hollows. We'll be leaving on time. Aye, sir. Jim Kirk headed for the doors, feeling as if there might just have been something wrong with him. He put a hand to his forehead and felt no fever. Stage fright, he told himself. Get up on the bridge where you belong and get the show on the road. The galaxy is watching. But just being watched had never made him feel this nervous before. My one of Rileru Nmuiput, Uhura said into the waiting silence of the bridge and touched a light to put the hushed circuit she'd been using on hold. Captain, the ship reports secure, and Commander Kathasat says to send its good wishes. Acknowledge that. Thank it for me, and tell it I'll see it when I get my next pay raise. Not sooner. Uhura nodded, a smile twisting her lips, and said another quiet sentence or so in Hest before closing the, before closing the channel down. Base control's ready to undock, Captain, Sulu said. Have them cast off at will, Mr. Sulu. All around Enterprise, lines of light flicked out. All but one attached to the tiny bright Humbalki tug and the secondary hull. This time, Katulik was not piloting. She stood glittering by the helm, watching the main screen narrowly and absently rubbing together the two forelegs that now boasted bright enamel and metal bands, her commander's stripes. That's Yatukt, Captain, she said, and her piloting's excellent, so I think I need not be here any longer. With your permission, I'll go down and see the inversion apparatus with Montgomery. First names already, Kirk thought, amused. Maybe it's a good thing she's not human. I'd hate to lose Scotty for paternity leave. Go ahead, Commander. She chimed off into the lift. Kirk sat quite calmly and watched the tug bring his ship about and head out the great irising opening into clear space. The tug put a little boost on the starship, rather than leaving her to hang, becalmed, so that she sha so that she sailed off at a few tens of kilometers per hour, and the star and the star base tumbled on its way in the opposite direction behind her. Last message from base, Captain, Sula said, and smiled a little. The tug wishes us goddess speed. Uhura, please acknowledge that with thanks. Mr. Chekhov? Distancing course locked in, Captain. 170... Distancing course locked in, Captain. 137 light years on a bearing plus 26 minutes galactic by minus 23 degrees g galatitude toward Akamar. Very good. Mr. Sulu, take us out past the warp drive perimeter. Very good. Mr. Sulu, take us out past the warp drive perimeter. Impulse power, one-third C. Aye. The starbase and yellow Hamal leaped away from them, seen in rear view, dwindled to a spark, and a golden ball shrank to a single fire. Scan, Mr. Chekhov? There was no need to say what he was interested in scanning for. Only local traffic, Captain. No company. Good. Keep your eyes open. Subspace detectors? Hot, Captain. Weapons control? Phasers are hot, sir. Torpedoes are charged. Kirk punched the comm button on his chair's arm. Engineering? Engine room. Aye, Scotty's voice said. His brogue was unusually pronounced. Jim smiled. If he was suffering from stage fright, he wasn't the only one. How's your baby, Scotty? Online and ready to implement. Good. Stand by. Spock? The Vulcan glanced up from his station with a look of utter calm that Jim read as fiercely controlled excitement. All ship's sensors on record for the first jump, Captain. From the off-Akamar position, 1,586.32 light-years to Iota Sculptoris. And that was when the ship's subspace and proximity detect and that was when the ship's subspace and proximity detectors began whooping, and the computer went to red alert without asking for authorization first. Warp ingress! Warp ingress! The alarms shouted, and all around the bridge people scrambled for battle stations. Kirk opened his mouth to shout, Report! And was beaten to it. Helm on auto-evade, Captain. Five Klingons. Six. Seven. 
The screen went to superimposed tactical and tagged the ships popping out of warp all around Enterprise. KL-8, Kaza, KL-96, Menenku, KL-66, Enekti, KL-14, Kajkuri, KL-55, Kaiten, KL-02, Amak, KL-782, Okov, KL-94, Tukab. No fire as yet, Captain. Trajectories indicate movement to englobe. Commander of Kaza on ship to ship, Captain. She orders us to surrender. Pop us out, Mr. Sulu. Warp three. Aye, Sulu said and kicked in warp and kicked in the warp field. The stars went strange, then normal again as Enterprise left the ambushing Klingons in real space. Accelerate to warp six, Kirk said. Standard evasion. It's a bad situation. Eight to one now? and base couldn't scramble us help fast enough to do anything, even if they had enough firepower there to make a difference. These guys don't want to hurt us. They want what we have. Yet, if we run too well, they'll just blow us up out of peak, knowing the Federation will build another of whatever we have. And we're outgunned. They've got those new hyperphasers. Damn. Even with Chekhov shooting and Sulu at the helm, these are ridiculous odds. A thought started. Kirk stopped it, half-formed. It gave him goosebumps. More alarms sang through the bridge. They're in warp, Captain, Chekhov said. Warp two and gaining, matching our evasion. Worst Russian accent ever, I'm sorry. It's a worse imitation of a bad Russian accent. <laughs> I apologize to everybody in, uh, on the planet. Pursuit came howling on their track, an octagon of pinpoints spreading out to begin a standard surround. Four up, four down, a cube's vertices. Running is silly. Shooting is silly. We need more firepower and there isn't any. How to buy us time? Mr. Chekhov, photon torpedoes, standard pursuit scatter, empty the tubes. Yes, sir, Chekhov said. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't know how to say that. Chekhov said, fingers dancing over the controls. If he had questions about the wisdom of using their whole supply of torpedoes before the engines could recharge the tubes for another salvo, he kept them to himself. Behind them, the Klingons jostled about, firing ahead to predetonate the torpedoes. Hard about, Kirk said, gripping his chair's arms harder than necessary. And drop out of warp. Mr. Sulu, you play tank games, don't you? Sulu looked over his shoulder at the captain in shock. Sir! Yes, sir. Get it right this time, Jim said. He watched the sweat break out on Sulu's forehead as his helmsman realized both the direness of the situation and the opportunity ahead of him. Aye, Sulu said, and the words sounded like a prayer. He hunched himself over his console and began to work. The stars wobbled and wavered and went sane, and the Enterprise popped out in empty space, dumping velocity at a rate that would normally have been impossible. Kirk glanced over at Spock's science screens and saw that Sulu had put the deflector shields up at full power a second before dropping out of warp, so that the shields were dumping the built-up kinetic energy as a blinding storm of hard radiation, everything from high ultraviolet to X-rays and synchrotron radiation. We're obvious as hell to anyone with sensors, Jim thought unhappily, but he got a touch less unhappy as emergence alarms whooped again, and all around them Klingons popped out of warp and went shooting past, breaking desperately, but not as effectively as Sulu. Kirk hit the con button again. Engineering! Scott here! What the devil's going on up there? Company, Scotty. Can you channel all the power of the warp engines into the shields, except when we're in warp? We're going to be running on impulse in real space for a while. All the power? Scotty came as close to squeaking as Jim had ever heard him. From his post, Spock looked over at Kirk with an expression so incredulous for a Vulcan as to suggest he had just discovered his captain playing with toy boats in the bathtub. Jim matched the expression look for look. Spock said nothing, turned back to his station. Aye, Scotty said from the engine room, but what are you going to do? Play fox and hounds. Kirk said. Bridge out. Mr. Sulu, evasive maneuvers at your discretion. Yes, sir. 
The screen showed that one by one the Klingons were flipping end for end to break, or arcing around in long, deadly graceful hyperbolas that would intersect with Enterprise's course. Several had begun firing already in typical Klingon attack frenzy, though the attack wasn't very effective as yet. The distance attenuated hyperphaser beams hit the shields and fizzled, their coherence easily disrupted. Sulu didn't run. He dumped more and more velocity while the Klingons streaked in closer and closer, and little by little the shields began to lose their blue-hot radiation fire and take on the angry red of splattering Klingon phasers that were becoming more effective by the moment. "'Getting ready for warp, Captain,' Sulu said. His face had acquired a fierce, closed look. "'Pavel, find me a star of type F or above within twenty light years.' Shock rang. Shock sang through Jim's blood. He sat straight up in his chair. "'Hikaru, what do you have in mind?' "'Bova's recourse, sir.' "'Mr. Sulu,' Jim said, as heads turned all around the bridge. Are you sure this is necessary? Sulu did not look away from his screen. Captain, he said in the same tone of voice, we can't keep this up forever. Do you have a better idea? Jim breathed in, breathed out, swallowed hard. No. You call it. Find him the star, Mr. Chekhov. Engineering? Here, Captain, Scotty's voice said. Shield status is good so far. But the inversion drive is powered out of the warp system, and if all the power is being diverted, we can We can't anyway, Captain, Catillac chimed in. The implement equations for the drive don't have all this swooping around vectored in. If we tried the jump, we could end up anywhere. Just stand by, Kirk said, sweating more. And when I give you the word, be ready to implement fast. The ship was practically at a standstill. The Klingons were screaming in at half a sea or more. Mr. Sulu? Warp three now, Sulu said, doing it, and space went bizarre. They were not alone for more than a few seconds. The Klingon sensors were more than adequate to tracking another ship in warp, with the cloaking device up or not. Enterprise fled through the wavery starlight, accelerating. Her pursuers came hot behind, matching her acceleration surpassing it, beginning to catch up. "'What was the dump for, Mr. Sulu?' Kirk said, trying to sound absolutely casual. "'To get them angry, sir. Nothing upsets a Klingon more than the suspicion that he might not understand what his opponent's up to. They've lost all face in front of each other now. They'll be furious.' "'Thanks very much, Mr. Sulu.' Jim said with gentle irony, and by sheer force of will kept himself from getting up, going down to the helm console, and fiddling with something. Sulu didn't need his distraction, or the implication that his captain was nervous about what he was doing, which his captain was. Yet it was sound strategy, such as one might have expected from the best helm officer in the fleet. He can handle it, Jim. Let him do his job. You sit tight and do yours. Look like you're not even worried. Warp five! Solo said. Warp six. The engines began that familiar soft moan that not even upgrading had changed, an unnerving subharmonic vibration in the ship's durasteel bones. Warp eight. Pavel, where's my star? If you are, as I think, looking for a star with no inhabited planets, Spock said calmly from his station without looking up. 109 Piscium? Piscium? 109 Piscium is an A3 with some unstable lines in its spectrum. Thanks, Mr. Spock, Sulu said, and hit his commi- commi- communicator. I know what that word is. I'm a Star Trek fan. Thanks, Mr. Spock, Sulu said, and hit his communicator button. All hands, prepare for dump from warp 8 and impulse maneuvers. Pavel, an open-ended course for 109 Piscium. Straight in approach. Chekhov nodded and began plotting the course. Kirk noticed with secret satisfaction that Chekhov was sweating too. As well he might. The course Sulu had requested was not for orbit, but for collision. Five seconds to real space. Three, two, one. The shields went up and the warp field went down. Sensors were blinded, but Jim's unnerved imagination told him well enough that 
but Jim's unnerved imagination told him well enough what any observer would see. The Enterprise blasting out of nowhere, blazing brighter than any comet, as free-floating atoms and the electrons of the shields themselves were so fiercely excited by the Warp 9 dump that they shattered completely in a hail of photons. I thought it was a Warp 8, yeah, dump from Warp 8, and we are here now saying a Warp 9. Do we have an editing error? We also have a hyphenation error. Oh my. So many things that are hard to ignore these days. When I was a kid, didn't notice much of any of that. So where was I? Where was I? A free fo- and as free-floating atoms and the electrons from the shields themselves were so fiercely excited by the Warp 9 dump that they shattered completely in a hail of photons and negatrons and other Bremstra- other Bremstralung radiation. Anybody close enough to use sensors on us is going to have them burned out, Jim thought with grim satisfaction. The emergence alarms told him well, that the emergence alarms told him that was happening right now as Kaza and Kitan and Maneku and their brothers popped out of warp behind Enterprise. Kirk could almost hear the enraged screaming as instrumentation set to highest sensitivity for the detection of a ship fleeing through real space was fried in a second. Long range sensing on pursuit ships is down, Captain, Spock said quietly. Scan indicates they are dumping and arming all weapon systems. Two ships are missing. I would suggest that Amok and Anekti are waiting to attack us in warp should we decide to re-enter it. Sounds reasonable, Mr. Sulu. Sorry. Sounds reasonable. Mr. Sulu, Jim said, watching as the images of six very annoyed Klingon ships began on the screen to converge on their position. Do your stuff. He did. It was terrifying. The Klingons made the velocities from their dumps last them as long as possible, instructing their battle computers to lay in courses that would intersect with Enterprise's most likely t- with Enterprise's most likely one, a hurried vector away from them and into open space for a pop into warp, where a mock and a necti lay in ambush. But Enterprise wasn't running her part of the battle according to the sensible, reasonable tactics they were expecting. Since nearly everyone in the galaxy now had the Romulan's cloaking device, making it almost impossible to initially detect a ship in real space, let alone bring it to battle there, the methodology of starship-level warfare had changed in recent years. Ships running almost entirely on instruments ambushed one another in warp, where the cloaking device didn't work and fought whole battles there, or forced a ship in warp out into real space, where running tended to be difficult for large ships and firepower was the determining criterion. Enterprise, though, wasn't following the rules. She would not fire warp, however closely Kaza and his brother destroyers followed her. Instead, she swooped and soared and dipped and rolled through real space as if a suicidal maniac piloted her. The Klingons' battle computers didn't have the necessary protocols programmed into them for this kind of real space fighting. No one could get close enough for even hyperphaser fire to pierce those shields powered by the whole unreserved output of an undamaged warp drive. Anyone who tried soon enough heard the sound of screaming, overstressed metal in his ship structure, and fell back to a saner, straighter pursuit, swearing. Kirk gripped his command chair's arms and wished he had such an option. Sulu had called up readouts on the screen for figures on the centrifugal and centripetal forces the ship was experiencing, readouts no different from those he had been reading in the tank game. When he blew up the ship, Jim thought, starting to twitch. He hardly needed the readouts. As the screen went through crazy roll-yaw-tumble sequence and his stomach tried to drop out of him despite gravity's reassurances that everything was all right, the intercom whistled in the middle of the mad chase and... What are you crazy... (laughs) What are you crazy people doing to my ship? Scotty hollered. Keeping it in one piece, Mr. Scott... I dinna think that's funny, Captain. Much more of this, and we won't make it to the next star, let alone the next galaxy. The screen was beginning to agree with him. Port Nacelle's stress tolerances in violation, it flashed, as Sulu snapped Enterprise leftward and downward in the beginning of a wicked roll, then up again, aborting the roll and leaving behind him Maneku and Tukab, who had been closing on Enterprise from either side, and now found themselves on intersecting collision courses. They peeled hastily away from each other, then streaked along for a second or so without initiating new courses. Spock, watching the bright lines of plotted courses on one of the screens, looked over at Kirk. Elements of arcs are changing, Captain, 
I believe the Klingons have gone off computers to manual pursuit, seeing that standard battle programming has proved ineffective. Good, Kirk said. It was old Academy wisdom that anyone who tried to fly a space battle by the seat of his pants was certifiable for reconditioning. Wonderful, he thought, looking at Sulu, who was hunched over his helm console, fingers dancing over it and hammering at it like those of a frustrated keyboard artist performing a particularly demanding piece. The helmsman hardly looked up at the screen except to notice the centrifugal septripetal readouts. Klingons were catching up to them again, flying peculiar courses that lacked the perfect grace and symmetry of the usual computer-coordinated attack formation. Sulu let them gather, let them run hot behind Enterprise for a few moments, then, without warning, flipped her end for end, letting forward thrust act as a break, and threw her right at the heart of their ragged formation, where Kazaa was flying point. Jim held his chair hard and kept his mouth shut while the screen screamed, Port! And starboard nacelle stress tolerance is critically violated. Abort maneuver! And Kazaa's image swelled on visual, a huge, grim, gray bird spitting phaser fire. They've gone completely nuts, he thought. They're going to ramp. And he was just opening his mouth to shout, Abort it! When the bird showed Enterprise its belly and the undersides of nacelle wings veering upward and away, coughing impotent photon torpedoes at them from fore and aft tubes as Kaza ran. The, torpedo the torpedoes were no threat with the screens fully powered as they were. Prepare for warp, Sulu said then, and Kirk swallowed, suspecting what was coming. Three to five episodes of warp without dumping. Chekhov, you have that course for me? Yes, Mr. Sulu. Engineering? Aye, Mr. Sulu, Scotty's voice said, sounding as if he was planning to have a long talk with the helm officer after things quieted down. Lock the inversion drive into Mr. Chekhov's computer. I'll give you three seconds. Warning. I'll give you three seconds warning of vector and acceleration for your implement. That be enough? His voice was calm. Behind Enterprise, the Klingons were coming about, leaping after her again. Two would be enough. Noted. Warp three now, he said, and the image on the screen rippled like water and steadied. Good, Kirk thought, watching speed and course. Not so slowly that they'll suspect anything. Not so fast that their damaged instruments will lose us. One Klingon popped in. Kaza. Another, Mineku, from ahead. Amak and Anekti swooping in, firing. Another, Mineku, from ahead. Amak and Anekti swooped in, firing. Sulu grinned like a shark and threw the Enterprise straight at Anekti. The biggest. For a terrible few seconds, it swelled, and the screen splattered red with its phaser fire. But then it veered off as hastily as Kaza had. No one was crazy enough to chance a full-speed impact in other space. Sulu, however, wasn't letting Anekti off. He went after him, ran right up his tail, seemingly ignoring the seven Klingons chasing after the two of them at a slowly increasing and respectful distance. Anekti fired at him aft, both torpedoes and phasers, to little effect and dodged and wheeled crazily in an attempt to shake Sulu. It didn't work. The forward rim of Enterprise's primary hull was less than five kilometers behind Anekti's rear end, and Sulu held her there as if the two ships were connected by tractors. He had status estimates displaying now on the stresses experienced by the Klingon ship, and, as Jim might have expected, they didn't look good. After all, a Klingon battleship was built heavy on firepower and speed, not so much for maneuvering their fighting style being biased more towards sudden surprise attacks, running down and gunning down an opponent and disdaining the subtleties of swift maneuvering as a sign of weakness. Enecti's structural status was poor and getting poorer as his helm officer, not as used to independent option as Sulu, ran terrified in front of Enterprise, turning and banking and having every move matched. And then Enecti made one move, a sharp downward arc that for some reason made Kirk's stomach lurch. Sulu didn't follow, but circled upward and away at warp 5, and behind them they saw Anekti's maneuver shear off his port nacelle. A second later, what was left of the ship bloomed into white fire as suddenly uncontained matter and antimatter spectacularly annihilated one another. Prepare for real space, Sulu said. Pavel? 
Have your computer talk to the helm. I'm going to hop once or twice more, and then I want to come out four light seconds from the star. No farther. Chekhov turned pale as paste, clenched his jaw, and began setting it up. Kirk nodded slowly to no one in particular. The only thing that had been missing from this encounter, the one thing that would make sure the Klingons followed the Enterprise as closely as, as they possibly could, was blood. Drop warp. Now. Space wavered. Settled. Klingons erupted into it behind them, gaining fast. Message from Kazaa, Captain, Uhura said quietly. They advise us to kill our helm officer and send him or her before us, so the Black Fleet will know what ship's crew to expect. Thank you, Mr. Sulu, the captain said. I think you've just been complimented. Thank you, Captain. Warp 2, now. And space shook again. Behind them, the Klingons got closer as Sulu used the warp field now to dump some of his velocity. Kaza and Maneku and Amak were now within effective attack range, and their phasers died the whole rear area of the shield. And their phasers died the whole rear area of the shields and warp field with bloody fire. Shield overload imminent, Spock said from his station, as if announcing the weather. Noted. How close are the leading three? Sulu said. Point two five light years and closing fast. Good. Last hop. Pavel. Engineering on my mark. We will drop warp and exit into real space at point nine C. You will then have three seconds to implement inversion. At plus three seconds. Aye, Scotty said. Pavel? 109 piscium on visual. Positive look. One star at the screen center grew magnitudes brighter with every breath. Six light years. Two... Point five. Klingons at two light months. Twelve light hours. Ninety light minutes. Ten light minutes. Thirty-five light seconds. Twelve to a hundred fifty thousand kilometers. Thirty thousand kilometers. Fifteen. Shields critical. Real space, Mark. What the hell am I saying? Real space, Mark. Sulu said, there was a, there was, there, real space mark, Sulu said, there was 109 Piscium, a sun-sized white star with the barest touch of yellow, a ranging globe licked with prominences and spattered with spots. Prominences, a, ra a raging globe, not a ranging, good God, let's try the whole paragraph again. Real space mark, Sulu said. There was 109 Piscium, a sun-sized white star with the barest touch of yellow, a raging globe licked with prominences and spattered with spots. Behind Enterprise, Klingons were popping out into real space, and Jim could practically hear the shouts of horror on their bridges as they realized the trick being played them and struggled to react fast enough to escape with their lives. Amak and Maneku went screaming off at crazy angles to avoid dumping into the star, not warping out, for no one went into warp closer to a star than 80 times its diameter. That was a good way to have it go Nova, and Nova's cataclysmic effects reached even into other space, destroying any ship within range as certainly as in real space. A mock turned too sharply and ruptured itself, letting loose another blinding flower of fire that continued along the same course like a disastrous comet. Chiton and Kushkuri swerved more safely, fleeing in opposite directions into the dark, striving for enough distance to get out of there into warp. Okov, unable to stop, streaked into the star, a drop of fire and a sea of it, unremarked. Tukab followed it. Only Kaza still ravened behind Enterprise, firing everything at once, phasers, torpedoes, knowing themselves doomed and not giving up. Plus one second, Sulu said, Plus two, and dropped Enterprise into warp, at warp nine. When a star goes nova, there are parts of the process that for a brief period surpass the speed of light, and crack easily into those nearby universes, such as other space, where light moves faster. Enterprise had been barely three-quarters of a million miles from 109 Piscium, 
barely... Th Enterprise had been barely three-quarters of a million miles from 109 Piscium at the furthest, no more than a half million miles distant when she ducked back into warp, now racing through other space at her highest speed. Her scanners clearly showed the rippling of space close behind her on the borders of the universe she had just left, as if she were a swimmer looking up at the water's surface from beneath it after a dive. The screen showed the rippling hitting the star they had left behind. They saw the star itself distend and writhe frightfully in the grip of the shedding they saw the star itself distend and writhe frightfully in the grip of the shredding space that held it. Saw the star blow, an explosion like the universe ripping open to reveal its first moment of existence. The light that was all there was. The light that was all there was. I'm not sure how, what that means in this context. They saw the star itself to stand and writhe frightfully in the grip of the shredding space that held it. Saw the star blow, an explosion like the universe ripping open to reveal its first moment of existence. The light that was all there was. They saw the effect of the explosion coming after them, faster than light could in that other universe. Warp two and accelerating, a globular pseudo-surface of deadly, searing fire that made the sensors back themselves hurriedly down like eyes squeezed shut. Warp three, warp five, the fire chased them, reaching out to eat them in this space as it had an exact... <laughs> warp three, warp five, the fire chased them, reaching out to eat them in this space as it had an exact inexorably. I know how to say this word, but my tongue doesn't want to say it out loud in this sentence. Warp 3. Warp 5. The fire chased them, reaching out to eat them in the space, as it had inexorably eaten the Klingons in the other. Spock, watching on his own screens the splendid destruction ravening in their wake, spoke softly to his computer, instructing it to notify the Interstellar Astronomical Union as soon as possible of a change in the status of 109 Piscium. The destruction reached out for them. Warp 7. Plus 3, Sulu said. Inversion drive implement, Scotty said from engineering, and the Nova and other space, and even Enterprise herself, went out. And that'll be the end of Chapter 4. That's pretty good. I read a good 23 pages. That's a longish chapter, isn't it? No, 20, yeah, 22 pages. That's a decent night's work. And I guess I've been live for 47.